from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. Technology generally and big tech specifically are regularly cited by politicians, media, and governments around the world as the root of many societal problems today. Accusations like privacy invaders, fake news amplifiers, job destroyers, discriminators, and more are commonly lobbed at technology firms with little recognition for the substantial value large tech companies have delivered over decades. Moreover, many powerful government officials have rewritten the history of effective government oversight and are attempting to apply antitrust law in novel ways that have virtually killed M&A and threatened to stifle American exceptionalism and innovation. Hello and welcome to this week's The Cube Research Insights, powered by ETR. In this breaking analysis, we welcome Cube alum, author, and senior fellow at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, ITIF, David Michella. Michella and Robert D. Atkinson have written a new book, parts of which we're going to unpack today. It's called Technology, Fears, and Scapegoats, 40 Myths About Privacy, Jobs, AI, and today's innovation economy. Welcome, Dave Michella, back on theCUBE. Good to see you, my friend. Thanks, Dave, good to be together. So look, we've cherry picked seven of the 40 myths that we're going to dig into today. But before we do, let's take a look at some of the spending data from ETR, just to frame the conversation. If you watch the, this program, you're familiar with this, the format of this graphic where net score or spending momentum is on the vertical axis and penetration into the data set is on the horizontal axis. That red line at 40% indicates a highly elevated spending velocity. Now ETR just focuses on the enterprise. So we've had to superimpose the logos of those firms that we don't track. Uh, and we've also put in the valuations. There are six with market caps in excess of a trillion dollars. As of this morning, Meta, Google, Amazon, Nvidia, Apple, and Microsoft. And the point is that these firms now dwarf to a large degree, the valuations of past leaders like Dell, IBM, Cisco, and Oracle, whose combined value is under a trillion dollars. And note, they're all above that 40% line, the trillionaires, or most of them anyway, are close to it. So they not only have scale and, and, and huge balance sheets, they also have momentum on their platform. So Dave, these six trillionaires, they, they take a lot of shrapnel and are often the targets of the vitriol. Now, we're not saying monopolies, uh, that break the law should be allowed to do so. Absolutely not. In your book, you and Robert Atkinson wrote, uh, Atkinson wrote, you you wrote that you want to lay out the facts and a balanced view of the issue. But I'll let you describe in your own words why you and your co-author wrote this book. Thanks, Dave. And yeah, you know, like you, I've spent my whole career in the technology business, and for the vast majority of that time. People were very optimistic and favorable uh, views of, of, of our business, uh, particularly those of us who were up in Massachusetts, where tech sort of revitalized the economy here and then later helped America uh, defeat Japan in, in the electronics business and all the benefits and great things that have happened through the internet. But really starting around 2017 with both the election of, of Trump and the Brexit referendum in the UK, perceptions of our business started turning negative. And it's actually been getting worse uh, for the last six or seven years, so that people want to ban things like facial recognition, or something like AI comes out with all of its incredible potential. And yet 90% of the stories are about the downsides and risks and, and what to so called do about AI. So Rob Atkinson and I really tried to uh, take this on head on. And we basically came up with a list of, of 40 things that, that people say all the time about the tech business and really have come to define pretty much that today's conventional wisdom. And we wanted to just see how well they really hold up to a, a reasonable scrutiny. And we're not saying that these fears, these complaints, these scapegoats, they're wrong, but we are saying, that often they're more wrong than right. And in many cases, they're highly, highly exaggerated. Uh, and, and so the book is really a, a way to, to walk through that. And the book is called Technology Fears and Scapegoats because sometimes that's sort of the generic fear that people have 
of the future. And other times people are just looking for scapegoats of, of who to blame for all the problems that we have in the world, be it polarization, misinformation, bias, uh, discrimination, uh, job loss, all these things. And people looking for something to blame. And unfortunately, tech gets far more of its share uh, than deserves. So you know, the book basically tries to uh, make that case. And as you say, give a more balanced uh, perspective on on really what's happening. So like all your books, I, I don't read them on Kindle because I get my highlighter out. The pages are all dog-eared because there's so much depth in them. So I really appreciate uh, you sharing with our audience. There's 40 myths. We don't have time to go through uh, even half of them. Now, the way it structured, you wrote 20 and Rob wrote the other 20 and we're gonna key in on seven of my favorites. So the first one we're gonna explore is myth number two in the book, which is technology is destroying individual privacy. I mean, the premise you put forth here, Dave, is that, that despite the issues that the media often points to about privacy concern, I mean, it's kind of like you were just saying with AI, technology actually has built in a lot of privacy. I mean, iPhone, Apple is really making it a centerpiece of their marketing. They built that into their products and services. And there's a lot of other examples that you wrote that technology has created far more privacy than it has destroyed. Yet the sentiment against big tech in this regard is, is kind of universal. So uh, we're going to bring back the chart and, and ask you to sort of explain this myth in a little bit more detail. Yeah, it's it's a classic. And, you know, what people often forget is that before technology and before the Internet, most people had no privacy whatsoever. Uh, and that if you lived in a small town, you know, basically everybody knew your business at the local pharmacy, the local shop or the local bookstore or whatever. And if you wanted to look up some sensitive issue about health or sexuality or gender or beliefs, uh, there was very few places and often times no cases where you could do that in any sort of confidential uh, manner. And so the internet has essentially brought massive amounts of privacy to virtually every American. And, and how many of us have never searched on something that you did because you'd rather not talk about it with someone else and you wanted to get some, some information. Uh, and, and we all do that. And, and when we do that, we're essentially making a, a bet and we're betting that, all right, you know, the servers at Google or Amazon or whatever, they might in some ways, you know, know what we've asked, but the odds of that coming back to embarrass you or uh, hurt you in any way, are very, very small. So people make that bet and by and large it's been an overwhelmingly winning bet. And that isn't to say that there aren't real privacy risks with today's technology. We, we all know this. Cameras are everywhere. There's lots of surveillance. We're profiled, we're targeted. Our locations are tracked. The data is retained for forever. You know, China shows us every day what a surveillance state could look like. But if you compare those and say, all right, hundreds of millions, virtually every American and, and really billions of people around the world benefiting from the sort of confidentiality of, of a standard search versus a smaller number, it's hard to say exactly how many, but in my view, order at least one order of magnitude, probably two orders of magnitude of, of people actually hurt in any serious privacy way, you see that the balance is, is overwhelmingly positive, and yet you almost never read a positive story about the internet's ability to increase privacy. And, you know, the organization I work with, the ITIF, they spend a lot of time, they're a digital policy organization. We spend a lot of time in Washington. And when you listen to the way, say, a congressional hearing talks about privacy, they treat, you know, a, a Musk or a Zuckerberg or uh, you know, Google folks, they treat them like criminals of basically abusing people's privacy to make money and almost never a good word. And, you know, I, I like to say, well, you know, if, if just once they might start one of those hearings by saying, you know, we're really grateful for all the privacy that technology does create in our lives, the ability to read something without everybody knowing what you're reading or to watch something rather than go to a video store and, and rent 
uh, a, a DVT, that all of these forms of, of privacy, they're creative. People should appreciate those. And then, okay, let's focus on, we don't want to be like China. We don't want to surveil everything. We don't want to keep data forever and, you know, have it so that the, the worst thing you've ever done, it might be what shows up on a Google search about you and, and those sort of real issues. But they, they're they manageable as long as we keep in context that the, the overall situation is not just positive, but overwhelmingly positive. So a couple of follow-ups. Am I, am I correct in, in asserting that credit card companies have a lot of information even prior to the internet that they collect on us? And I, I've always felt like somehow that seeps out there. Are, are the sort of restrictions on credit card companies or even, I just don't recall that kind of, of, of animus toward those companies and the financial institutions. Do they not have sort of similar data on us and, and how is that protected and why yeah. do you think that that's not been as much of an issue? Yeah, I mean, that's clear that, you know, the information business is a really complex ecosystems of banks, credit card companies, governments, healthcare organizations, insurance organizations, uh, you know, law enforcement, all kinds of people with all kinds of data out there. So why does tech get signaled out? I think it's pretty clear they get signaled out because they have the money, they have the power, they have the visibility. Uh, but, you know, those other firms that you mentioned, they're really in the business of trading that data. Uh, the, you know, the, the big tech companies, yeah, they, they want to sell ads, but you know, their primary business is to get people to, to use their services. So I think they get way more of the blame than they really deserve. Well, I mean, you're right. In front of Congress, a lot of finger wagging at, at Zuckerberg. Of course, they make all their money by essentially appropriating our data and targeting us sure. with ads. But that's the quid pro quo of all the value that they provide. Yeah. And, and you know, if you ask people, you know, would you pay for this service or would you rather get it free for ads? The, the overwhelming share of people say, I want it for free. And people who've tried to make a $20 a month service or this or that, it, it's 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 tough going. Uh, and, you know, that may change. There are certainly people out there who want to take on the, the, the advertising model and that's part of the tech competition and business. But thus far, consumers really like free. And, and who doesn't? All right, moving on to the next myth. It's number three in the book. Uh, social media is polarizing America. I mean, this the conventional wisdom here is that social media certainly amplifies our divisions and creates this flywheel effect that exacerbates polarization. Is that not the case? Uh, maybe you could explain your thinking on this one. Yeah, I mean, the privacy one is, is sort of a fear issue of people worrying about that. This is, a, to me, overwhelmingly an issue of, of scapegoating. That you know, when people try to say why is America so polarized, it's so easy to blame it on social media. But the reality is, we're polarized for real issues. You know, Donald Trump is a uniquely polarizing figure, whether you like him or not. The country is deeply divided over abortion and guns and immigration and climate change. You know, our political system is a 50-50 tribal system that clearly uh, leads to uh, you know polarization built in to that you have a the mainstream media whether it's fox news or cnn they're polarized themselves and, and contribute to this so there's all these real sources of polarization and to me they're actually extremely similar to what america was like in the 60s you know in the 60s America was incredibly polarized, again, by a war, unpopular war, by assassinations, by riots, by protests, by drugs, by the counterculture, and all of these things. And all of those polarization happened without any social media whatsoever. You know, you look at Trump, you know, Trump was polarizing whether he was on Twitter or kicked off of Twitter. It, it made no difference really at all. And so I, I think a lot of it is scapegoating, but as you say, that yes, that social media amplifies it. People say more harsh things uh, sometimes when they can be anonymous and do it. You know, filter bubbles and algorithms and these things have their place. And uh, there's propaganda and there's fake news. There's mystery. All, all the things that are out there. But to me, they are they really are sort of drops in the bucket compared to the main issues. And, and so why why are we so focused on social media? I think it's primarily a question of, of scapegoating and, and convenience. You know, what's more appealing to a politician or mainstream media than saying, 
well, the problem isn't us. The, the problem is this new stuff. And, and in fact, you, you could easily title this section, you know, mainstream media agrees that new media is, is the problem. Uh, it's basically just shifting the blame to the, the newcomer, the new way. And that's a familiar pattern, but I, I don't really think it really holds up to scrutiny. Well, it's interesting. I mean, I've never been on Truth Social, um, but I, you know, it's got, I guess, millions of followers. But I don't I hear as much about Trump as I've ever, I've ever have. And while it's true that, you know, the big four, China, Russia, North Korea and Iran will use social media to foment uh, dissent. It's almost like people complain about crypto because ransomware use crypto to commit fraud, but a lot more fraud is is created with with or or perpetrated with with actually hard currency than than with with crypto. And of course, then there's the TikTok piece, uh, which is quite interesting, and we'll see what happens there. You've always been a proponent of of of, of, of approaching that from the standpoint of hey if if you're going to not allow our platforms to participate in an open way in china then you can't here start there on those grounds versus you know some of the other uh, rhetoric that we hear any thoughts on those points yeah two things there the, the tiktok thing as you say i although i'm generally in favor of all kinds of free speech and open platforms in this case where the situation is so un unbalanced that Google and Facebook and X cannot operate in China. So why on earth would we allow TikTok to operate here? It's a simple matter of fairness and reciprocity. And see, to me, you don't even have to get into all these national security and things that do, which in many cases I, I think are exaggerated. You, know, you mentioned the Russia and China and Iran and North Korea. And yeah, they try to interfere with our elections, but I can news for you. We, we try to interfere with people's elections all the time around the world. Uh, and to me, this whole storyline goes back to the election of Trump, where so much of it was blamed on Facebook and Cambridge Analytica and Russian bots and, and, and all of these things. And I think most of that, of the impact of those efforts has been largely debunked, but the, the myth uh, lives on that and I'll just give you one fact on it. By most estimates, people think that Russia maybe spent a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars on on bots and various uh, propaganda efforts that they made. Well, the campaigns each spent over a, a billion each uh, with their getting the message out. So you either have to assume that it's a drop in the bucket, or Russia is so much smarter and somehow is using things so much more effectively. And there's no reason to think that. I, I think again, this was primarily a way for, in this case, the people on the losing side of the election to to find the scapegoat. Why did we lose? We lost because of Cambridge Analytica and, and Facebook and, and Russian bots and and all of these things. And and I think that is just, uh, you know, just people just kidding themselves. Uh, you know, we just came off of uh, three shows this week, two of which were cyber related. Uh, the Mandiant, MYs, it's not, I mean, it's part of Google. It was a cybersecurity show. And then CrowdStrike, I was out there and and in, in, of course, these big four come up. I, I feel as though that, uh, you know, election interference is not the big issue with those. It's it's really protecting our critical infrastructure. Yeah, um, absolutely. Healing secrets and ransomware. And that those are much, much bigger problems. Oh, yeah. Without question. And and, and we're, we're not very good at that. Uh, and we, we do change the, the, the subject matter and onto the things that are that inflame people for, for little reason without taking actions on the things that really matter. And I totally agree with that. All right, next, let's move on to myth number 11 in the book. The, this one was interesting. The pace of technology change is accelerating. You said that's a myth. It was kind of surprising to me when I read this, but of course I, I read deeply your logic. But I mean, to, today we're seeing, you know, new LLMs come out daily. The number on Hugging Face, I think is nearing a million, might even be over a million. But your angle on this comes from, one of user and societal adoption. So walk us through uh, this slide and your analysis. Yeah. I mean, a standard way of, of looking at the pace of change for any particular technology is just ask how long does it take for half of the people to have this device? And if you look at that over all the things you see, starting with electricity and phones and going up to the 3D goggles, what you see is, 
is a, is a very consistent pattern. Uh, and the first two there, electricity and telephones, it took a long time to get a wire the nation. And that was very complicated and very difficult and took many, many years. But since then, if you look at radios and televisions, you know, they were adopted extremely quickly. Within less than 10 years, over half of Americans had them once they were commercially uh, a viable product. Much faster than PCs, roughly the same as the internet, a bit faster than mobile phones. Uh, and, and so if you look at that data, you, you can't make really any case that the pace is accelerating. And that is strengthened when you look at sort of all the new stuff, home robots, Fitbits, 3D printers, smart watches, blood pressures, thermostats, not one of which has reached the 50% adoption. So the rate of adoption is not accelerating. Uh, but there's some other ways to look at this question too. Uh, you know, sometimes the sort of companion lot argument here is that the impact is is uh, is greater, is accelerating it, and that's not true either. That you know, the tech industry is roughly sixty years old, from 60, 1960s to to today. If you just look at the sixty years before then, the technologies of those sixty years are far more impactful on, on people's lives electricity and lighting and heating and cooling and air conditioning and movies uh, and telephones and planes and cars and trains and you know, all of these. And you could go on and on and on. You know, many of us, as it gets hot in the summer, we wouldn't trade the entire internet for our air conditioners. Uh, and, and so, you know, those innovations of the physical world are clearly more important. So I don't think it's accelerating and I don't think the impact is getting greater. And I'll, I'll just throw one other thing out there and, and another way of looking at sort of the speed of change. And, and that's to look at the so-called eras, you know, the mainframes, P, many PCs, each of those eras, you know, mainframes came out in the fifties and sixties, the minis in the sixties and seventies, the eighties and PCs in the seventies, eighties and the nineties and the mobile you know, in the 2000s and 10s and social in the 20s and now AI in the 20s and 30s. And those eras are all roughly a dozen years each. Uh, so even within the IT sector, the pace of major shifts and paradigms is, is actually remarkably consistent. Uh, and so why, why do people think that it's getting faster? Well, one of the reasons is they, they sort of uh, conflate applications with platforms. So sure, you know, ChatGPT get 100 million people in a couple of months. Well, why is that? Well, I didn't have to buy anything. I didn't have to install anything. I could just go use it. And to me, that's no different than saying that, you know, the Milton Berle show on TV went from no users to 50 million users in a year because all you had to do was turn on the station. And so that the applications, whether it's Facebook or Google or ChatGPT, it's it's much easier to put an application on top of a radio program, a television or a computer or the internet than to buy a new platform. And, and so when people throw those numbers around, it's like, yeah, that's great for it's 100 million, it's unbelievable. But it's because it's so easy. It was no more difficult than doing a Google search. So billions of people already knew how to do that uh, rather than having to go buy a, a, you know something and, and learn how to use it. So all of those things, I think, are basically just modes of exaggeration. That so the pace of change is remarkably consistent as far as I can see. But so my, my follow up is, do you think that'll change? I mean, what's the fundamentally because electricity and telephony, you had to put in all this infrastructure, the power grids, the, you know, the phone lines. Uh, do, do you think that that will change given that we do have the internet, that we do have all this, you know, computing power to, 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 to leverage. Do you think that the pace will change or well, are there it, it, underlying it, factors? I, I'm not sure I want to make a prediction whether it will or won't. I'm pretty comfortable saying it, it hasn't. And, and when I look at AI, AI itself, the basic logic of neural networks and machine learning is 60 years old. You know, people understood these concepts in the 50s and 60s. It's taken all that time to become a usable, powerful thing. And, and now it's in its growth phase, you know, like an iPhone and everything is flying around it. Uh, but 
you know, it doesn't mean that AI is a year old and everything's happened in a year. It took forever to get to this point. And like all of these eras, you know, it has its run of, of 10 years. And I don't make any pretense to look beyond that. But I, I would say this, that as amazing as AI is, and we may get to this later in the talk, the needs and challenges and demands and, and importance of the physical world is still far more important. So just yeah, understand uh, what you said yeah. about 60 years. So when I started in this business, AI was a thing. Everybody was talking about it. Is yeah. that what you would... If if you put AI uh, on this chart, is that when you have started would have started the clock? You know, forty plus years ago. I wouldn't put it on there because it's not a device. I would put that on there as an application. Right. Make, uh, make. And so, you know, that would be like Seinfeld or Friends or right. the Milton Berle show or or Facebook or things that just run on top of things. Because even though have... potentially its impact could be you know monumental, yes. Yeah, I, I, the one thing I would say, and I see where you're going with this, I actually, I think it is true that the impact of the waves gets bigger and bigger. So the impact of the mobile era or the internet era was much bigger than the impact of the mainframe or the mini computer era. And it's entirely possible that the impact of the AI era will be bigger than the impact of, of any of the previous ones. I, that I totally agree. The the impact is greater, but the speed is is not. Great, great analysis. Okay, let's move on to the next one, which is good segue here. Your, I think your first book was uh, addressed these waves and sort of uh, explained a lot about the structure of the the technology industry and the disintegration of, of tech and the and the shift from mainframes to PCs. But this next one is big big tech faces no competition. That these large companies are just so powerful. Uh, and insurmountable. Uh, quite interesting. I remember you gave a speech in 1995 at the IDC briefing session. You said it felt like Microsoft had reached its peak of power. That's the year that they, you know, were, were really at the peak. I mean, you called it exactly with Windows 95. People thought it was absurd at the time, but it proved correct until Satya became CEO. Here on this chart, you show the leaders of each era and how they come and go. And in the case of Microsoft, they even come back, although you don't have them in this next generation column, which is which is maybe the point, and it's quite interesting. Walk us through this myth, please. Yeah, and you know, people say that who say that big tech faces no competition are they're being just a historical because competition is just to find this business, and all you have to do is open your eyes to see that the, a new generation of, of leaders is already out there. I mean, you see that the list here of companies that have come and gone, and some of them last a, an year or two or three, but but most of them don't. But you know, I think that if you simply look at all right, who is the leaders of this next generation? Well, it's AI, it's, you know, it's Nvidia, it's TSMC. It, it, they didn't even exist in in the the previous era. So you know, if you and you look at uh, well, I look at China and India for this all the time. How much of the technology leadership is simply going to be them? There weren't even players in, in any of the, the previous eras. India already today dominates the computer services business, uh, probably more than Asia dominates the hardware business, if that's even possible. Uh, and, and so the, you, know, you look at Tesla and BYID and crypto and all and SpaceX and Starlink, it, the leaders are right there. And yeah, I probably you could easily add Microsoft in the next generation. And hats off to them for making the recovery and and you know what they've done and revitalizing themselves and doing that, which was not an easy thing to predict. And we'll, maybe we'll talk about that more when we get to the, the antitrust stuff. But in, in general, you know, every one of the today's market leaders, the so-called titans, you know, the Google's, Amazon, they all have serious competition. I mean, China is doing everything it can to make it so they don't need Android phones and they don't need Intel, and they're going to pull that off. Uh, you know, look at what TikTok has done to Facebook and could do to them. You know, uh, you, the competition is is there. And, you know, it's to me, it, the key thing with this chart is, oh, here we go again. It's the same pattern, that it's very hard for new companies to lead in, in new areas. And we'll see how Google does with AI and search. And that will be really, really interesting to, to see how it plays out. But you know, history, you, know, you already see the, the, the scenarios for changes there are huge. Yeah, what percent of your time is spent on alternative search platforms, quote unquote, and search perplexity is 
uh, gaining a lot more of my time as is open AI. I want to I want to pick up on something you said about China specifically in the book. You had talked about the the potential for automation uh, bringing back um, American manufacturing, uh, and at the same time, you sort of indicated that that it's going to be it's a kind of a lesson learned. Become so reliant on on China for for so much of our manufacturing. At the same time, I was recently listening to some of the stuff from the All In Summit, and a couple of the professors there were saying, you know what, China and you outsourcing that manufacturing has really enriched Silicon Valley. It's not necessarily such a bad thing. And, you know, at the same time, you see Huawei today basically, you know, copying. Uh, Apple's uh, format when they're launching a new phone, they're high fiving people as they walk in. All the associates are clapping. I mean, so it seems a little bit um, uh, uh, more insidious than benign. But yeah, uh, absolutely. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. You know, in a book that in many cases is defending the tech business, we, we criticize them on three main grounds a pretty lousy job on security with ransomware, malware, and identity and all that stuff. Pretty lousy job in protecting kids from harmful content and more, more could be done there. And the third, a pretty lousy and, and short-term view of taking all the advantages of globalization and not realizing where that was going to take you and now finding themselves in a world where they're completely dependent on Taiwan and, and, and China and for things that may not uh, be in their interest in, in the long run. And if there's anything I would fault the, the, the big titans for, it's not realizing that they are, sure, they're global companies, but first and foremost, they're American companies and, and need to at least be seen as caring about that issue. Uh, and I don't think they've done a very good job of that. And you know, that's become the issue over the last year or two. And it's just going to become even more of an issue because the China challenge ain't going away. Uh, they're going to be strong across the board. And it's not just a question of protecting the American market. The, the global market is 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 up for grabs in, in many cases. So I think that is uh, probably their, their biggest challenge. You know, they can make money today by selling their advanced stuff to China and they can keep doing that. But is that going to be the right thing in the long run? And it's that general tension between short-term benefits and particularly very long-term ones. And, you know, they've ridden that China gravy train for since China went to the WTO in 2001. So over 20 years of good times, but it's not like you couldn't see this coming. You and I were at a conference uh, when we were at IDC together. I think it was 98 and um, it was in Paris. And you'll remember Ellison was up on stage. He had that three piece, not three piece, but the double breasted suit. Um, McNeely piped in. I got to interview him. Ellison was amazing at the time. I was just out at Oracle uh, Cloud World a couple of weeks ago. He's still up on stage. It's just incredible. Uh, the reason I bring that up is because I brought Deb on that trip, and it was the first time I, we I ever went to the Louvre. And I immediately, when we stepped in, I grabbed her by the hand and said, "Let's go see the Mona Lisa." Just very, you know, shallow of me, but I just wanted to <laughs> beeline there with your book. When I opened it up and I saw the myths, I went to this next one right away. Data is the new oil. It's sort of, sort of one of my favorites. And and I, when I saw it, I thought you would talk about how data doesn't follow the laws of, of scarcity. In other words, I can use the same data in many ways, but oil I can only use once. Okay, that's an interesting nuance. But you have a far uh, more profound angle um, and chose to highlight. Um, it's somewhat nuanced, but it is more fundamental. I wonder if you could explain. Yeah, I mean Data is the new oil, oil, new oil. I wish it were true. You know, if, if only the world revolved around computers and data and information and connectivity and networks, yeah, life would be better. But the reality is that energy is still the main force in the global economy. And energy shortages and energy prices lead to inflation and geopolitical tensions and fragile supply chains and environmental issues and a race for electrification and electric cars and electric infrastructure and all of these things. And in the real world, those things are more important to national power, to national success, uh, and in many cases to wealth than data. 
as you say, there are all kinds of parallels that data and oil, their general purpose, they've created great fortunes. Uh, they come with so-called externalities. They need to be sort of refined and they they can have uh, various side effects and, and things. Uh, and that's all there. But in the end, energy is still the most important thing. And if you know, electric, if you just look at the electric car and the and the moving away from fossil fuels issue, there's nothing comparable in, in the tech sector that will get society's full attention. So the and you know, the bottom line is to me is the physical world of food, shelter, transportation is still more important than the virtual world. And I think I'm not sure that will ever really change. You know, people go to war over the physical world. They they tend not to over the the, the virtual world. Uh, and so as I said, I, I wish it were true. I wish we were in a post energy, post oil world, but we're not yet. Okay, uh, thank you. Last myth that we're going to touch on, it kind of brings us full circle to to the, the, the antitrust cases have been essential um, and by implication successful at regulating big tech. This is another favorite of mine as we watch Lena Khan affect the way the Sherman Antitrust Act is applied. But the point is market forces, and you make this point many, and you have many times, market forces have been far more successful and effective at regulating big tech than these broad actions, like for example, breaking up Google. Let's take some time to analyze kind of the history of government regulation in big tech and some of the unintended consequences and, and the remedies that you think actually do make sense, Dave. Yeah. Yeah. First thing is that the IT world has a very, very rich history in issues of antitrust. And, and so why, why is that? Well, it has to do with some of the unique features of technology that that you know software businesses particularly have very, and many internet businesses have very low or almost zero marginal cost, so that rewards scale. They're complicated businesses sometimes, so fear and uncertainty and doubt sense tends to make strong companies stronger. They have these network effects, so that the more people have them, the more benefits they are. So you have all of these sort of industry characteristics that tend to create increasing returns to scale. So having big dominant companies has been the norm in our business for forever, you know, for 60 some odd, odd years. And every time you get a big dominant company, someone says, you know, we, we need to break them up. Uh, this isn't right. And if they have their case, but there's so much evidence that indeed you don't because technology deals with these problems. People thought IBM was unbeatable, unstoppable, all powerful and all knowing and would go on to dominate telecom and banking and factory automation and all of these fields. But in fact, the simple innovation of the microprocessor, which led to the personal computer, which led to local area networks and then much more, basically obsoleted everything IBM was doing. Uh, and that that was what took care of IBM's power. Everybody thought that AT&T monopolized the telecom network and had to be broken up and it was broken up into seven little mini AT&Ts. And people thought that was a great thing. But what really changed network? Well, well, it was the shift to wireless networks. It was the shift to packet switch networks. It was, you know, switched to broadband cable networks. These are the things that brought AT&T down and you know, I mean, AT&T is still successful companies, but they took away any notion of them being monopolies and, and all powerful. And the same thing with, with Microsoft. Uh, if you go back to the 90s when people thought, they used to refer to him as Tyrannosaurus Gates. He was gonna take over everything related to technology because he was a predator and he was unstoppable. And then, oh yeah, oh yeah, they missed mobility and oh yeah, they, they missed the internet. And, oh, you know, they eventually recovered and did great things. But, you know, those sectors, they still never really got a position in those business of any great significance. So once again, tech did it. And then there's Intel, the same thing. Oh, you know, they have too much control over personal computers and that's the foundation of everything and everything. 
Well, of course, Intel missed mobile and now it's missing AI and and you know more about Intel and they, but their, their their position is weakened. But you know, all four are still here. They're not monopolies, and technology change took care of all four of them quite quickly and quite handily. And then you look back and did we really need decades long antitrust suits to to do things? And uh, we'll we'll talk about them. And there are some benefits, but there are also some real unintended consequences that are worth uh, highlighting. You know, if you go back to at and one of the big impacts of the breakup of the Bell system was that each of those regional ones could now buy their telecom equipment from whomever they wanted. And oftentimes they chose other suppliers from around the world. And there was really no home anymore for then uh, Western Electric and then Lucent. And Lucent Western Electric went from the world's biggest telecom equipment manufacturer to non-existent and was actually bought for a song for, by Nokia. And to this day, America has a very, very small place. It's dominated by European, Japanese, and, and, and Chinese suppliers. Uh, and so that's and it, same thing with, with Bell Labs. Uh, once the world's greatest research center by obviously unanimous views, disappears, no more funding from it in that model. So the, the at and one, especially in Washington, is always cited as a tremendous success. And it's, it's just, it's very hard to look back and, and say that was the case. Uh, yeah, they America shifted to wireless and internet and packages, which was so did everybody else around the world. And they, they didn't have to do it this way. Uh, in the same with, with you know, Microsoft, that, that you know, that case, of course, they didn't last as long, but, you know, they came, there was a very strong effort to break up Microsoft. They wanted to split the operating systems and applications businesses. And if they had done that, the profitability of both of those groups would have lagged and the recovery that Microsoft has made and, and who it is today, you made a good case never would happen. And that if they had broken them up, it who knows what things would look like, but it, it, a good chance it wouldn't be the way it is. So for those for the company, for those shareholders, and if you like what Microsoft has done, which I'm pretty positive about, you know, that scenario is not there. And then the same, same thing with Intel. You know, the government sort of forced Intel to make life easier for AMD. And for a long time, that actually helped consumers with, with some lower prices. But it weakened uh Intel fundamentally, and it also accelerated the, the fabulous view of, of, of that business, and it reduced Intel's profitability, and, and it's at least partly responsible for the, the very weakened Intel that exists today. So the unintended consequences are tough. Uh, but as you say, there have been some targeted benefits that have been good, and you can go into those if, if you want. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, so I just wanted to comment. It's hard sometimes because people... They see the dominance of these companies. You and I remember, again, I think you're the one who told me about this years and years ago, that IBM at one point, by your estimates, had three quarters of the industry's revenue and 50%. Yeah, the whole industry. So can you imagine, I mean, if the if the industry today is, let's call it $4 trillion, you're talking about a $2 trillion company with half of the profits, that would be just insurmountable, you would think. But, um, and the same thing with Microsoft, but hubris and you know the thought that they're invincible you know, caused IBM to outsource, you know, the the operating system and the microprocessor to uh, Microsoft and Intel, respectively. Microsoft went on at its peak to try to build, you know, Windows phones, uh, which the market just didn't want. And so, um, but I'm also often critis critical of Lena Khan. Um, I, I look back at ARM and NVIDIA, you know, maybe even though that wasn't she who made that call, it was, I think, the UK uh, Competition Committee, uh, at least had a big hand in that, but but looking back, perhaps that was an okay thing. I'd love to hear your thoughts on on that in Nvidia. But but let's go to those targeted measures because I, I don't think you've ever said, nor have I, that if a company's breaking a law and or they're bundling or doing things that do uh, uh, violate the Sherman Antitrust Act, they should be punished and there should be remedies. What should those remedies be in your view? There have been remedies throughout the history, and and sometimes they've been very good ones. And, you and IBM's case, and you, Dave, know this better than anyone, it was government pressure that forced IBM to make it possible for third-party providers of, of disk drives and 
tape drives to connect their products to IBM big systems and the companies that, that did that. Uh, and that was a really good thing. Unbundling their IBM software really helped establish the software industry. In AT&T's case, they were forced to allow third-party modems to connect to their network, something they, they didn't want to do. They were forced to allow a carrier like MCI to connect to their network, something they didn't want to do. And similar sort of interoperability things were there with Microsoft and Intel as well. So that the pressures to sort of open up their platform to make it easier for competitors uh, to have some sort of specifications and standards, these have a pretty good history. It's the breakups and the threats of breakups and all that really uh, I draw the line at. And that to me is the big problem that, that I would have with Lena Khan, that she believes that the bigness in and of itself is a problem uh, and ultimately will harm consumers. And I think that's wrong because as I say, the tech business has increasing returns to scale. So bigness is part of the business and, and really can't be taken away. And, and I, I still have a problem too with, you know, you had IBM was one monopoly and Microsoft maybe was one, but today they, they talk about Google and, you know, Amazon and Meta and Apple, they said they're all monopolies. You can't have five monopolies. Mono means one. And, you know, they're, they all do compete with each other. So they're not monopolies in any sense that IBM would recognize. As you said, IBM had 75% of the entire computer business. That was a monopoly. Uh, and, and so I think today's, I have no issues with the FTC looking at business practices and and seeing which ones will help make for a better environment. But when they try to say that you know, they've abused this and they need to be broken up and these huge fines and these long cases, uh, you know, those things have I mean, not worked so well in the past. Yeah, punishing success seems to be the model. And yeah, and, yeah. And, 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 and Lena right now, I mean, well, anyway, the, the sentiment of breaking up Google, it was interesting what you were saying about Microsoft. Had they split the company, they might not have been able to to, they might have become irrelevant and 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 not been able to fund their their turnaround. You think about Google and the the massive competition right now in AI between all the big tech companies and new entrants like OpenAI, who supposedly is raising another you know six billion dollars or so. Um, that to me, let the markets you know yeah, absolutely play out yeah. and, and and they will. What do you make of Nvidia? I mean, Nvidia fifteen years ago decided to to basically risk everything and and start investing in in its software platform it ended up you know it bought Mellanox uh and it just it, it I remember its stock got crushed during this time frame and it virtually has no competition so in that sense it's a monopoly but it 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 had earned it through you know foresight and, and maybe a little bit of luck and, and tailwind uh, but I don't see what they've done wrong do you have any thoughts on that I don't think anything wrong at all. They're, they're doing what's always been. They're the leader in their market and everybody gravitates around them for as long as they are the leader in their market and, and good on them. Uh, so I don't see it. And, you know, you talk about these sort of breakups. There's nothing more sort of easy and, and sort of fun about this sort of armchair chess playing. It's like, oh yeah, I could break Google up into their phone business and their search business and, you know, and their documents business and YouTube business, I, that would be sort of interesting. Or, oh, maybe Amazon should be broken up their cloud and their retail and Facebook should be broken up. It's so easy to see how that might be tempting to people, but the history of all those isn't good. And as you say, at a time when all of those companies are gearing up for battle with China, do you really want to, to hobble them and, and weaken them for the hope that it might lead to stronger competition around when there's really no evidence you know, if you took those pieces apart in Alphabet, do you really think that's going to strengthen the American competitors? I sure don't. No, and and think about consumers. I mean, I love Amazon. Um, I love yeah. Amazon Prime. I know I pay more as an Amazon customer. I don't care. I love Thursday night football. I love yeah. the content they produce. They've got fantastic, you know, Prime Video I love. That's funded in a large part in many quarters and even longer term by AWS, you break those two up as a consumer, there I'm you actually, know. you know, it could be affected in, in negative ways. And so, again, I think your, your, the clarity of your thinking uh, is right on that 
that that narrow measures are going to be much more effective and um, and perhaps uh, perhaps Lena will see this, Dave, and uh, <laughs> and, and will change your mind, but I doubt it. But uh, but hey, thanks so much for for your time. I'll give you the last word. Oh, uh, just <laughs> not that I'm good actually. <laughs> okay. Hey, well, thanks again. It's, it's called uh, Technology Fears and Scapegoats, 40 Myths About Privacy, Jobs, AI, and Today's Innovation Economy. Pick it up wherever books are sold. Uh, Dave Michella, great to have you on. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Good to be with you. All right, that's it for now. Thanks to Alex Meyerson and Ken Schiffman on production. They're actually in the air today, which is why I'm in my office and on Zoom. And they handle our podcast as well. Kristen Martin and Cheryl Knight, they help get the word out on social media and in our newsletters. And Rob Hof is our editor-in-chief over at siliconangle.com. Remember, all these episodes are available as podcasts. Wherever you listen, just search Breaking Analysis Podcast. We we surpassed a million downloads last year. Thank you for subscribing. Appreciate it. I publish each week on thecuberesearch.com and siliconangle.com. And you can email me at david.vellante at siliconangle.com or DM me at dvellante. Comment on our LinkedIn post and check out etr.ai. They get great survey data in the enterprise tech business. This is Dave Vellante for Dave Michella and the Cube Research Insights, powered by ETR. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you next time on Breaking Analysis.